morning and turn them over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. This series is uh, one of the longest that I have ever done, that I can recall anyway. Um, and I didn't intend to, when I started ministering it, I didn't intend to, uh, for it to go this long. But uh, it is really just the, uh, you get into certain subjects that you just, in some ways you kind of want to move away from them, and then the Lord just continues to deal with you. And uh, I've been ministering on the subject of the blessings of boundaries, creating boundaries in your life, particularly uh, protecting and honoring the place of the house of God in your life. Um, Cindy and I were listening just briefly to a pastor that ministered alongside of uh, Dan Johnson over on the coast. He pastors a, a large church, uh, a fairly large church in the Tri-Cities. And, and he said something that is very, very true. He said, we live in a day and an age where people want to be in relationship with Jesus, but they don't like his bride. And, and he said, you know, if, you're, uh, if, if you don't like my bride, you got a problem with me. And, and he said, you know, a lot today, people do not like the church. And they don't want to be associated or they don't want to rep uh, see the value of the house of God. And, and he said, you know, it's, it's a spirit that we have to, as pastors, uh, we, have to head, we have to hit head on and we have to deal with that. And that's very, very true. I, I mean, you know, you, you know, in my opinion, you know a man uh, is, is, is seeking the Lord when he, and in tune with the Spirit of God when he said, I, maybe I should say, maybe I know that I'm in tune with the Lord, uh, seeking the face of the Lord. Uh, because that's the way I feel. Listen, you can be saved your whole life and not grow much. If you die, uh, you may go to heaven, but you may not know much of heaven on earth at all because you're not a part of the church. The church was not man's idea, it was God's idea. Right. In spite of all of its flaws, in spite of all of its trouble, in spite of all of the battles and... Uh, in, in spite of all of that, it was still God's idea. And we have to get through all of that. You do, I do, everybody does. And we have to understand that this house, not because it uh, belongs to anybody but the Lord, and not because of their special carpet or chairs or whatever, but because of what it represents. As long as you and I as a body petition the Lord, uh, seek the Lord, and beg the Lord, to come into this building and make it a place where people can encounter Him, God, I believe God will continue to do that. The moment our faith moves away from under, uh, us understanding we need that, that it's the only value that the church has is the moment that His presence and His power meets people, then God will cease to be here. The Lord loves us to be dependent on Him. He will maneuver our life uh, it purposely until you are dependent on Him. I remember uh, not last year, maybe not even the year before, maybe it was three years ago uh, that we went to men's conference. It might have been the first year that, that uh, I went, but there was a man there that was a lieutenant, former lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Rangers. And he said uh, he was retired, but he said, you know, when you're training people, he said you'd be out front, and Frank uh, probably knows this, you're you know, in front of men, and, and, and they think they're paying attention. But he said, you know things they don't know. You know the realities of the things you're teaching them. You know, because you've been there, that if they don't really hear what you're saying, they could die. It's a matter of life and death. And he talked about that this one kid, you know, was kind of half paying attention to him. And he said, I could look by, I could see by the, the, the look on his face, they were out on some training course, and I could see by the look in his eyes that he wasn't really paying attention to me. He said, I just went behind him, I was, uh, you know, walking in between these rows of men, and I just walked behind this young man, and I grabbed him, and I threw him to the ground, and I put my hand around his neck, and I started to press. And he said, and his eyes got big, and he said, are you listening now? 
And brothers and sisters, that's sometimes what God has to do for us. Life has to do that. God has to allow life to do that sometimes so that we understand the power, the eternal truth of the things that we're listening to. I believe I've got somebody very close to me in my life that I am watching the devastation that's happened in their family because they got out of church. At one time, very uh, loved the Lord, very powerful relationship with the Lord. God really working in their family. God doing miraculous things in their marriage. And and uh, this this person doesn't live anywhere around here, but they are close to Cindy and I. They're a part of our life. And we have watched, they mistakenly, I don't know how this got into their head, but they believe God called them out of the church. And that was probably 10 years ago. And they've been out of church for the last 10 years or so, maybe not, all, maybe not that long, but close to that long. And we've watched the devastation in the marriage, in the family, their children. We've watched the devastation uh, on them emotionally and now physically. And I'll tell you something, the, the, I know I've mentioned this, I think every service that I've uh, dealt with this subject, I've mentioned this, that Pastor uh, uh, Jude Fuquay, who was my daughter Jessica's pastor in California, I loved, I'll never forget uh, this message that he entitled, The House That Built Me. And he was talking about the church, and listen, whether you and I know it or not, we need all of the conflict that happens in the church. You know that? The conflict reveals who we really are. It's easy to play mature. It's easy to act like nothing bothers you. It's easy to act like you're mature in Christ and, and you're above all of that. But I'll tell you something, even the conflict in the church proves us. It will either mature you or it will expose you. The, the, all of the battles, Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said, even those that are that are not real and not true among you are necessary. The people that come in, you know, we work so hard because we want perfection and, and, and we've got false ideas about righteousness and false ideas about what the, what the bride is really to look like. And we work so hard to get the wheat out or the tares out of the wheat. And here Jesus says, I'm going to let them both abide together. Why? Because one proves the other. You see, those you can look at conflict. You can look at people. You can either look at poor, even look at poor leadership, vindictive, angry leadership, leadership that's out of touch with God, and God even uses that. I want to just share with you some things real quick. This is not actually my message. I want to get into Isaiah chapter fifty-eight and fourteen. First of all, let me read verse 13. It says, If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day. Listen, we know today that we don't. The Sabbath is not a salvation issue. But let me just say something. The Sabbath was never a day of worship anyway. It was a day of rest. It wasn't a day of worship anyway. But the principle of guarding the day if possible that you and I get together and worship God. And, and guarding that, I'm telling you, it's the same as guarding your relationship with God. Your emphasis on the house of God and your emphasis on God is really hard to separate the two. It really is. And, and listen to what he says. He said, you're going to have to turn your foot away from doing things that bring you pleasure. You see, what, what, is the, what is the eternal battle of the human soul is that it's empty. And it is looking either for something to fill it or something to pleasure it. You can divide all people in the world. One category is much larger than another or the other. Either people are looking for something to fill their soul, which is only Jesus Christ, or they're looking for something to pleasure it distract them away from what's really going on in their life. And he said, and if you will call the Sabbath a delight, that's the inward, that, that's the man that nobody knows, the woman, nobody knows, the opinion nobody knows about but God. Do you know you can come to church 
but not call it the Lord's holy day or call it a delight. You can be here and not want to be here. You can be here because you have to be here. You can be here uh, for a lot to, to make yourself feel uh, righteous or whatever. Or you cannot be out, you cannot be here with the same kind of emotion. Listen, what God honors in us, what God responds to, is what only He knows about. It's the hidden man of the heart. Why is it that two people can do the same thing? And one be get blessed and one not get blessed. How can two people, you know, give in the same offering? And I'm not saying that, that I've seen this, I'm just saying I've heard about it. I've had people come back and they're frustrated and they're irritated. How can two people give and one monetarily and one be blessed and one not be blessed? Well, we can understand what blessing really looks like. But a lot of it is the hidden man of the heart. I just want to say something. That I have more respect for people that attend the house of God with no ulterior motivation. They, I mean, you can see it in their life, you see it in their mannerism, you see it in their heart. I have more respect for a person like that than I do anybody else. Because I know the battles that life hold, I know the battles that church can hold. And I just want to share with you just a, a it says this, it says, if you will honor and desist from your own ways and from seeking your own pleasure, listen, you're going to have to stand against your emotions. More and more and more as, as the world gets more troubled and, 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 and when we feel this inside, we feel and, and we know as a nation that our opinion of the house of God, our opinion of Christianity is dwindling, it seems like, by the day. And there's something that enters your mind sometimes that if, I, just need to, I just need to get away. I just need to go somewhere. I just need to, to go someplace. I, I think I'm just going to go see a movie, or we're just going to go shopping, or we're just. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things as long as they're not driven by you trying to somehow escape what's going on inside of you. Brothers and sisters, Satan is trying to eat at the place people, at the place God's house has in people's lives. He's trying to eat at it in me and Cindy. I, I've asked, this is kind of a funny thing. I've asked myself many times, do I hold on to three services a week out of some kind of religious duty, or am I hungry for God? And then on the other end of it, do you just want to cancel services during the week because you just want more time to not whatever? You know, those are things that, that ultimately I won't do until I've got a word from God. I mean, I, I, won't, I won't move either direction on that until I know that God has examined my heart and shown me what He sees in me. And brothers and sisters, this house, not, not this house, but the house of God, and it can be this house for many of us, if, if this is where we believe God has called us, I'm telling you, there will be no place at some point in your life, there will be no place Satan will war against more than where God has called you to be. No place. No place. And I just want to show, I want to throw just six things at you real quickly before I actually get into what I want to do. I, I may not get to it today, but six things that Satan's going to try to drive, things that Satan's going to try to drive you out of the house of God with number one, that I think the pinnacle, the most common today, offense. Offense. Can I just say something? I don't care what anybody has done to you or what anybody has done to me, period. It is no excuse for me to hold something against anybody. Never. That's why Jesus said, be quick to forgive. Be quick to forgive. Why? Be Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, oh man, God has convicted me. He's saying, listen, Randy, to what comes out of your mouth. Jesus said that one of the things that is going to mark the last days, think of this, he could have talked about nuclear war. He could have talked about homosexuality. He could have talked about drunkenness. He could have talked about uh, uh, drug addiction. But of all of those things, Jesus chooses, hear me this morning, Jesus chooses to say in the last days, many are going to be offended. 
And that offense is why their love is going to wax cold because God can't continue to deal with you when there's an offense in your heart. And we all know, and listen, this is the dangerous thing about most offenses. We don't know we're offended. And then we can kid ourselves into thinking, I'm not offended. You know, I'm just having a hard time. I'm not, not really offended. Brothers and sisters, in the day that we, in the, the age that we live in, here is one of the things that I have fought, and I think you probably fought it because it's human nature. And that is this. I've got to find somebody to blame for where I am. I've got, it is very, it is almost supernatural today for a man or a woman to say, I am my problem. I'm not going to blame somebody. I'm not, you know, in fact, if we back up into Isaiah chapter 58, what is it in verse 9? It says, if you will stop the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness. And how many know that those two always follow one another? You point the finger, you speak wickedness. It always follows one another. Listen, offense is something that is so dangerous, that is so dangerous to you and I spiritually, that, that we should be vigorous. We should be, we should be absolutely, powerfully, uh, overly careful. Right. To make sure that nothing hasn't gone into our heart. Right. Yeah. Because when you are offended, you can be deceived. Right. Yeah. You can be deceived about people. You can be deceived about direction. In fact, offense, what offense does is God has to step back. And when God steps back, now the covering over your thinking, your decision making, your mind. Brothers and sisters, this is something that we're, I, I'm telling you that... that I, 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 I search my heart about this stuff and I still don't know many times if I've got an offense that I haven't taken care of in my life. Right. Number two, self. Self, Satan will try to use self to drive you out of the church. I'm not getting what I wanted. Other people are favored, whatever. I mean, it can take a thousand different forms. Self is so incredibly deceptive and hidden that it takes the Spirit of God many times for us to really be able to see it so that we can deal with it. When you look at Asaph, and Asaph is going in Psalm 73, going through warfare, and, 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 and he's, he's actually backsliding while he's going through his ministry. He, I said this on, on a couple of weeks, or last week, or whatever it was. Here he's a choir master. He's... Uh, people know him as a great man of God and inside he's falling away from God. And it's because he's fixated on his own suffering. Right. And he's comparing himself to other people and he's saying, you know, I'm trying harder and I'm working harder and I've been serving more and whatever and, and look at me compared to that person. Right. Brothers and sisters, please hear me. This is what the chain of events that I see in most people's life. It doesn't start out for most people. It doesn't start out with, bam, they're divorced. Or, bam, there's a fall of some kind. Or their life is thrown into turmoil. It starts in the hidden places. And then it goes from there and it gets into visible places. Yeah. And, and when you, and, and, and the Bible says that Asaph was so fixated on himself that he, he almost fell away. And the Bible says, until I went into the house of the Lord. I can't tell you how many godly men and godly women that one day when I'm in eternity that I'll walk up to and say, it was a conversation. It was something you said to me. Cindy and I have many people to think, to thank, looking back over our life that kept us from a self decision. I'm not talking about obvious selfishness. I'm talking about selfishness that you can't even, as I said, you can't even see it for what it is. Uh, you know, uh, Pastor uh, Shane and Pam and myself, and and we've been talking about uh, some things about leadership. Pastor John and I have talked about things with. 
And, and one of the greatest testimonies I've ever heard about a leader, a selfless leader, was Pastor uh, Dick Iverson of what is now City Bible Church in Fort Worth. Dick Iverson took that church when it was, he took it over from his father when it was about 90 people. And he built that ministry up to, to I don't know, it was 3,000 people or so, I think, when he uh, resigned. He built Ministers Fellowship International, the organization that Cindy and I and some of our other leadership are looking at uh, for an umbrella over us as leadership. And uh, built MFI, he built Portland Bible College, one of the few true Bible colleges left in the United States of America, especially one of even fewer true spirit-filled Bible colleges left in America. And, 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 and at 58, I believe he was 58 years old, still, still alive, still vibrant, no health problems, no, no reason, healthy wife, healthy children, nothing wrong, no moral failure, no battles. But at 58 years old, he calls Frank DiMazio and he says, it's time. And I'm turning over the church to you, the Bible college to you. I'm turning over MFI to you. And the man walked away and never turned back. Doesn't even, never has even attended there. It was like, it was like that man so understood that everything he had done belonged to God. It was never his. It was God's. And I've admired that because I'll tell you something. I prayed just last night. I said, Lord, are you done with me here? I'm not talking about done. God's never done with us. But I'm talking about there's times, there's places, there's moments that God can say, I want you to move on. I want to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, and listen, I'm telling you this. I want to say this as a person. I want to say that though these decisions and these, these kind of things that, that can get into your uh, heart and your life, man, I'll tell you, we take, it so needs God to know when to step up. If you're not careful, you'll step, you won't step up because of self. I don't want to be a bear. I don't think I can do that. I don't, I, I, you know, I don't want to risk my reputation. What if I make a fool out of you myself? What if you do? I would rather be a wet water walker yeah. than a dry boat talker. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, what if you do? What if you do make a mess of it? What if, what if, what if, what if it doesn't go well? So get up and go on. Yeah. You know, listen, self manifests in so many different ways. I love what Watchman Nee said when he said, you are not to examine yourself in the sense of spending all day or a week or a month or whatever you are, looking inside. You're supposed to say, God, you're the only, you're the only judge I can trust. I can't even trust my own judgment about myself because I'll either condemn myself or I'll excuse myself. Yeah. So you're the only true judge yeah. for me. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, this walk that we walk cannot be walked out without intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Right. You'll miss the moments to step up. You'll miss the moments to step down. You'll miss the moments to step forward. You'll miss the moments to step back. You'll miss it. When I'm done with this series, I'm preaching a series on the parable of the ten virgins. And the five wise were five people that understood they needed constant revelation, constant illumination, that never could they do without the illumination, the revelation of the Holy Spirit. If I get away, they understood. If I get away from that, if I fall back on myself, if I fall back on anything other than you, you know, I'm dealing with a situation and there's a there's a so much at risk in a particular situation I'm dealing with. And when I look at it, I look at it and I think to myself, if this thing, it's a, a, a marriage situation, if this thing goes down, 
And it will affect, if nobody else, it will affect their children. And I'm thinking to myself, if, it, if that happens, it will all be because somebody could properly see what was happening. And I'm telling you, the, the need for illumination of the Holy Spirit in your life, Satan will try anything. Number three, number one, trying to get you out of the house. Number one, offense. Number two, self. Number three, people. I'm talking any kind of people. We read several stories in the New Testament of people that were kicked out of the church. Imagine that. Kicked out of the church. Not, not kicked out for the reasons of 1 Corinthians, but kicked out because they were sick. Kicked out because they, they were blind. Kicked the woman with the issue. Kicked out because she had a constant, uh, she had a constant, uh, what's that called? Hemorrhage going on in her body. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that it would be easy for this woman, as so many have, and this is what's happening in America today, as so many have that the church is a nasty, ugly, horrible thing. And they live in something that happened uh, a year ago or, or a hundred years ago. It really doesn't matter. I, lo I looked somebody in the face a uh, week before last, and I said, listen to me. They were trying to tell me a story about their suffering. And their suffering was real. But I said, listen to me. I said, I've got people in my church that make your story look ridiculous. I'm not being disrespectful, but they make your story look ridiculous. And so what I'm trying to say is the difference between people is not that somebody has suffered and somebody else hasn't. We all will and we all have. The difference is how you handle it. When, when you meet people that, that God has blessed their life, has His hand on their life, I promise you, if you got to know them well enough, they could take you back to a situation, and if they see it in the Spirit, they could say, right there is where Satan tried to ruin me. He tried to ruin me with an offense. He tried to ruin me with an attitude. He tried to ruin me with a betrayal. He tried to ruin me with somebody that I loved and that I cared for that failed me. He tried to ruin me. When I was a young man, a young Christian, I would go see elderly people and I can't tell you how many times planning a funeral, I would have uh, uh, somebody say, they, they were not what you think they were. And they leave this legacy in their family or in their marriage of anger and, and, and I, would, I would think, God, how does this happen? And now I'm 47 years old and I said, I know how that happens. I know exactly how that happens. And, and listen, when Satan develops a plan, and, and please believe me, this situation I talked about just a moment ago about this marriage, it was a cleverly devised plan in him. I'm not trying to be a downer today, but I'm telling you this is true. Satan has a cleverly devised plan in hell to try to sidetrack you. To try to ruin you. And part of it is to get you out of the church. And I'm not saying by any means that, that you know, you can only be in one place, but I do, I, I do believe this. There is a particular place you're supposed to be. And most of the time, it's not where your flesh wants to be. It's, it's where God is using situations to, to pull something out of you and pour something through you that requires a brokenness. It's what I said this morning. I want to, I want to you know, there's a scripture in, uh, in the parable of Jesus with the uh, seed and the soul. And if you read it and don't understand it, and I didn't understand it for years, I just had taken my faith that, Father, I know your heart, I know, I know your nature, so I know that's not what you mean. But you read that where Jesus said, lest they understand with their heart and be delivered. And it looks like Jesus is actually saying, I don't want them to be delivered. But that's not what he said. What he's saying is, I will let no person get revelation in their intellect, by their intellect. You're not going to get revelation from God in your intellect. Do you want to know why? 
Because you can get something intellectually and you never have to bow, and you never have to bend, and you never have to spend time on your face gutting it out with God. You never have to spend time letting God peer into your soul and say, Lord, you've got to show me who I am because I don't know. Right. You don't need any of that if you can get it in your mind. Right. And, in the, and in, the, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that they, they use this term, they were a deceitful bow. And what it means is, is when they were making a bow, like a bow and arrow, they, they, a deceitful bow is one, you, you would try to bend it and you would just to string it and it would pop back in your face or hit your arm or whatever. And they called it a deceitful bow. And what he's saying is there's people that will not be bent they will not bow. And any true revelation, I, I promise you, any true revelation you've ever gotten from God has come after you have bowed. I'm talking about in the privacy, I'm talking about things that people don't even know you bow to. And it doesn't matter if they ever know. But places where you finally had to say, not my will, but yours be done. Places where you finally just had to give up and give in and not even know what you were giving up to or giving into. Just saying, I just feel like this is God. I feel like it's His will. I'm just, I'm just going to yield to this. Brothers and sisters, this woman with the issue of blood, the blind man, John 9, kicked out, known as cursed. Either him or his parents how easy would it have been for either one of them to live in anger for the rest of their life and say, if that's the way God is, if that's the way His church is, then fooey on all of it and I'll die in my anger and my bitterness. But both of them ended up being touched by Jesus. The woman with the issue of blood with her last strength said, if I can only touch the hem of His garment. There's a time, listen, I don't care what people are doing to you, what the church is doing to you, what everything, whatever, whatever life is doing to you, you've got to somewhere in your mind say, so i got to get through all that. I need to touch Jesus. I need to touch Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the number four is trouble in the church. Satan will try to drive you out of the church by, by the trouble that's in the church. Please, please hear this. A lot of people think, well, if if this was, if God was really here, or the leadership was really this, or the leadership was really, we wouldn't have any trouble. Well, I beg to differ with you. That's not the story of the New Testament. The church at Corinth had trouble. The church at Ephesus had trouble. The church at Galatia had trouble. The church at Thessalonica had trouble. The the the, the uh, of the five or the seven churches in Revelation, five of them were rebuked. Churches have trouble. You know why they have trouble? Because they're made up of people. And we have trouble. You know, it's weird to me that people that have trouble come into a place and bring their troubles into a place, and because there's trouble, they're upset about it. When they know they're trouble, they're part of the church. I'm trouble. I'm human. The more you get to know me, the more that will become really evident. Listen, you, you, sometimes our expectations is why we're offended. Our expectations were unrealistic. Yes. Why is it that you can go to a bar and if somebody yells, screams, cheats, steals, whatever, you're not offended? Because your expectations were here. Yeah. But you don't come to the church, your expectations, sometimes they're just unrealistic and that's why people are offended. Mature love Listen, how many know the difference? A lot of you do, because you're married. You've been married a long time. You know the difference between immature love and mature love. Immature love is that you think that, that everything's going to be hunky-dory and that your love is going to be built on this foundation of my spouse is perfect. That's immature. That ain't going to happen. That's why a lot of marriages failing in America is because they have unrealistic expectations right. built by Elizabeth Taylor that had eight marriages. <laughs> and I'm not trying to diss on the lid, but it's true. Every movie, every movie anymore has a storyline that basically says if I just 
If I just meet the right, if I just meet my soulmate, I'm going to be happy forever. Your only soulmate is Jesus. Listen, mature love. My wife has loved me maturely. And you know, honestly, I want to say this. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm not trying to whatever. I'm just saying this. I'm surprised how much my wife loves me. Mature love is when you've seen each other's flaws, you 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 know their shortcomings, you know what we what we can be to each other, what we can't be to each other. That you're that you're okay. You love in spite of that. That's mature love. And brothers and sisters, listen. There's going to be trouble in the church. Absolutely. And, and, and I think the best way to train people is to train them knowing that. You know, when we're in the military, uh, I'm, I've never been in the military, but I know Frank and others of you in this house, and, and I've had very good friends that are in the military. My son's been in the military. They don't lie to you. They don't get you in boot camp and say, hey, we really, we really don't expect you to get into warfare. Uh, you know, really, th th those people really, we don't really think they want to kill you. We think right. they're just kidding. We think there's playing game. No, they tell you right off the bat, you're gonna be fighting for your life. These people want to kill you. My son was telling me the other day. He said, Dad, one of the hardest things to understand is the first time a bullet hits your vehicle, and you're going, I never did anything to these people. It doesn't matter. You're wearing the uniform. And he said, that really does. You, you hear people say that, but it doesn't register until it's your vehicle, and all of a sudden you start hearing bullets bounce off it. And you're going, they don't care who I am. They don't care that I'm a nice guy and I've tried to serve my country. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, listen, it's better to teach people you're going to have trouble in the church. Right. You are. You're going to. I'm telling you, as the pastor of this church, you're going to have, when I look back over some of the decisions I've made, I shouldn't have made them. I shouldn't have made them. I brought trouble because there was some immaturity in my life. And so, I, listen, I'm just, I'm just, I'm going to own it right now. I've never do it purposely. Never. But your trouble here might be because of me. And it's better that you understand that I know I'm human. Right. And if you come to me, I'm going to do my best to take responsibility for it. But you've got to anticipate trouble in the church. And when you do, then you don't come in with this false sense. And see, our society, you know, listen, I, I, don't, I don't want to get into politics. And, you know, whoever you vote for, you vote for. I don't want to get into all that. But here, here's what I do think. Now, Donald Trump has said some things he shouldn't have said. Don't misunderstand me. But I think one of the reasons that a man like him... Is, is so gets under people's skin is because our culture has become so dishonest. Yeah. Yeah. So politically correct that when somebody steps forward that can't be bought yeah. and that can't be shut up yeah. and that really doesn't care what anybody else thinks. Right. Yeah. That everybody goes, we're not used to that. Yeah. We're used to people that can be bought. That they have a price. Yeah. Now listen, I'm not I'm not saying to vote for Donald Trump at all. I'm, I, in fact, I, he would not be the candidate I would vote for. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that this is why I think that a lot of America is going, whoa. But when you really get past all that and hear what the man has to say about a lot of things, you're going, I can kind of understand that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I just think that our whole culture, you know, uh, this man that's coming here, this missionary, he's lived most of his life outside of the continental United States. Half of his ministry in Guatemala, half of his ministry in Spain. And he said, when I fly home to America, and he said, and I see what my nation and my birth has become, he said, I just, it's like it's not even the same place I was born in. Yeah, and, and he said, I just, it shocks me how much it's changed. And, and a lot of it is this political correctness. Listen, you're going to have trouble in the church. Number five, leadership. 
leadership will cause you possibly to 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 leave. And listen, I'm talking about I'm talking about leadership, both that is reasonable and leadership that is unreasonable. David looked at Saul. He wrote in the Psalms and he said, "You attempted to drag me out of the heritage of the Lord." And brothers and sisters, hopefully, no leader will ever purposely do that to any of us. But I do know this: you're going to be tested by leadership. You're going to be tested as to whether or not you can forgive, whether or not. Can I just say this? Submit doesn't even begin until we disagree. These things are going to be challenged in, in all of us. They're going to be challenged uh, as a leader. You're going to be challenged as to whether or not you can admit you're wrong. Submit to people in the body when they're right and they're wrong. And be able to genuinely yield your heart. You see, everything that makes... The kingdom of God work starts in the unseen. Until you and I believe that apart from prayer and, and seeking God and spending time on my face, I will have no control over my decisions, over my or at least little over my emotions. When we went to men's conference this last time, one thing that was said there <clears throat> impacted me. He said this. He said it's 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 uh, scientifically proven that when you are confronted with something unexpected that makes you mad, that statist or scientifically they have proved that your brain is hijacked for 18 minutes. It is hijacked. It's in the, he said in those 18 minutes is where people have killed each other, when they've made decisions that they can't change. How many people have gotten mad and, and you know, uh, punched a wall and afterwards you're going, oh man, now I'm going to fix that. You know, or, or like, you know, <laughs> break your phone and then afterwards go, man, that was a $400 phone. <laughs> what was I thinking? You know, and uh, I, I watched this show. This, it was a, a documentary about, it had to do with this. This lady and her husband, no kidding, this lady and her husband, we're in a fight. I mean, a knock-down, drag-out, yelling, screaming fight. The husband was mad at the wife because the wife, he thought, was flirting with another man. They had been drinking. He thought that his wife was flirting with another man. They pulled up to a stop sign. They're in a knock-down, drag-out, screaming, yelling. I mean, going at it. The man is so mad, he shoves the car in the park. He gets out of the car goes around the front of the car to start walking down the street to go home. She hops in the driver's seat, puts it in park, follows him, runs him into a brick wall and kills him. Oh, oh my. Four kids. Yeah, four children. And you know what? Here's what everybody said. The prosecutor, the defense attorney, the judge, every one of them said the same thing. We, don't, we do believe you did not mean to do this. But that doesn't excuse it. You took a human life. And in 18 minutes of uncontrolled rage, she is now spending life. She was, she was convicted of first-degree murder. They offered her a plea bargain of third degree. She rejected it because she said, I, I, there's nobody to raise my children. She never thought she would be convicted. They convicted her of first-degree murder. She is in prison and for life without the possibility of parole for the rest of her life. 18 minutes. Your brain is hijacked. I'm telling you, when I heard that, I thought, I need to get a, an eight, a clock with 18 minutes on it, you know? And, and every time I get mad, chain myself to something, set that thing, put, you know, put tape over my mouth, yeah. set that in front of me, and wait for the 18 minutes to tick away, and then yeah. 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 <laughs> Leadership. Yeah. So, brothers and sisters, listen, these five things that I've said, are going to be things that Satan is going to try to use to drive you out of the house of God. You know, conflict, whatever it may be, they 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 can make us better. If you if you find a wise man or a wise woman, I'll guarantee you they become wise by some of the conflicts they've been in and learning to resolve it and praying about it and seeking God about it. And 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 I always admire that. And people, when I hear somebody, I used to, when Pastor Keith was here, I used to love to listen to him counsel. I just wanted to, I just wanted to listen to him, just glean his wisdom. So would you stand with me this morning?